for allowing me to join you. Yeah. Amen. George, you open that window. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry. Watch it. All right. Okay, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up to the book of Joshua. Joshua, we're going to try to cover two chapters this morning, so uh, I'm going to go relatively quick. Try to stay with me. Do the best you can. Some of the information we covered last week. And um, so we are in thanks. So we are in the book of Joshua. I don't know if I have a mic. You guys can get it. Um, so Joshua chapter 3, if you want to look at Joshua chapter 3, and what we're going to do is we're going to make some application. Remember, the Bible says that they were written aforetime, they were written for what? Our learning and our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So the Old Testament, it, really, it literally unlocks the New Testament. The things that we see that were written aforetime in the Old Testament, they were written for you and me to learn from. They were written so you and I can draw a practical, devotional, or even a doctrinal application from these portions of Scripture. God just didn't take Israel through this histor historical event for no apparent reason. Every detail that God does in the life of the nation of Israel is purposely done. Every aspect, every detail, everything that God commands and tells his people to do, it's very significant. Sometimes we read these stories and, and we just think that God is just telling them what to do just for the sake of telling them what to do. It goes a lot deeper than that. Do you guys understand that? It goes a lot deeper than that. Everything that God commands them to do, everything that God has Joshua to do, it's there for a specific purpose and for a specific reason, okay? And you have to understand is that God is a God of precision. Everything that happens in this world happens under the sovereign hand of Almighty God. Nothing happens by coincidence. Nothing happens by chance. Amen. Everything that happens happens under the very Amen. sovereign hand of Almighty God. Nothing just coincidentally just takes place or conspires. Amen. Everything is under the very sovereign hand of God. We're going to see that that uh, Joshua tells the priest to go into the into the uh, Jordan River, and once they get there with the Ark of the Covenant, we know that the water is split, and they go across the Jordan River. Now, here's the unique thing, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant to the nation of Israel, it was literally their their presence of God, and it was the power of God in their life. They knew that that thing was supernatural and all-powerful, and they knew that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he dwelt in the midst of that ark, and that ark was sacred, and it was holy, and it was literally the power of God in the nation of Israel. That's what the ark was. It was the power of God, and it was the very presence of Almighty God right in their Right in the midst of them. Now, the good thing about this, when we look at this, right, you and I, we are the what? The tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. So now, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant anymore. We don't need the tabernacle anymore. The Bible is very clear. It says your body is the what? The temple of the Holy Ghost, which is what? It's in you. In the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle, and his primary area was in the holies of holies, but he dwelt in the midst of the Ark. But now, in this dispensation, God dwells in what? Us. in the believers. Yep. So it, it works like this, if you kind of understand it this way. In the Old Testament, God dwelt in the tabernacle. He went up. And then we see in the New Testament with Jesus Christ, God dwelt in the person of Jesus Christ, and he went up. And guess what's happening? God dwells where? In the believers' heart. And guess what? He's going back up. You see how God works in a threefold fashion? And so once we begin to understand all these things and how the Word of God is put together, it's going to help carry you through life's obstacles and life's struggles. Now, the great thing about this, right, is the ark is going before them. We've seen the story that the priest was told to step into the water of the Jordan River. And once they stepped in, the water just split like this. And that was the very presence of God, and it was the very power of God. Now, here's what you have to understand. God's presence and God's power was going before Israel. No matter what, Israel had to go into, the, into Jericho and face battles after battles after battles. But the one thing they were counting on, it was the what? It was the presence of God and it was the power of God in their life. And guys, what we have to understand is you've got God's presence in your life because you are the what? The temple of the Holy Ghost and you've got God's power in your life. And God is going before you. Sometimes we think which, which um, charting on terror, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, going off uncharted ground. Listen, guys, 
Everything has already been mapped out. God has already gone before you. His presence, his person, and his power has already gone before you. And so many times we think, oh no, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What does it matter what's going to happen? God has already gone before you. And this is what we lose sight of. And we lose sight of the what? Of the ark, which is the presence and the power of God. God told the people of Israel, he said, keep your eyes on the ark. Because once they would keep their eyes on the ark, they could see the movement of the red, of the arm. Um, the, the waters, they could see the presence and the power of God doing great things. And the problem is, is we take our eyes off of God and we take our eyes not being fixated on Him. And then once again, we've come, overcome the fear and worry and discouragement because we don't realize that God has already gone before us. God is in the midst of the presence. Now, before they could overcome any battle, before they could overcome any conflicts, they had to have what? The power of God in their lives. They had to have the ark in before them. Now, so let's look at this story. We're in uh, Joshua chapter 3. Now that you have a little bit more information on it, but also here, what is very unique here, if you look in verse 1, and Joshua rose early in the morning, and he removed from Shittim, and he came to Pat, and he came, and he came to Jordan, and he and all the all the children of Israel lodged there before they passed over. So they camp out there, but notice in verse 2. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host. So now we're dealing with three days, which all be obviously points us to the what? To the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has given us a vivid illustration of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in this portion of Scripture. Once again, God just doesn't tell the people of Israel to do these things for no apparent reason. God wanted you and I to have insight of how deep his word really is and how profound the word of God really is. Some people think, well, we just read those. Those are just stories. Those are just um, fables and fairy tales and just stories that, of the past. Or well, even if some people believe the historical accounts, they say they're just historical accounts. They never really happened or whatever they might believe. Let me tell you something. The things that were written aforetime, they were written for what? Our oh, learning. And our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. One of the greatest things you can do is study the Old Testament and read that Old Testament book because you can draw so much from there. So this shows us that we have a picture of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When that, when those priests carry that on down, there's the death, they come up, and there's the resurrection, and here's the great part. What happens? All the people go what? Before them, and then what do we see? We see God not only in the in the future of the nation of Israel, but we also see God protecting them from the hinder pots. And we've seen this in the book of Exodus, when God was when God was in front of them, when the Egyptians were attacked, and then God was behind them. And you know what God does? God protects us in the past, and he protects us in the future. And sometimes we don't understand that. Sometimes we think things just happen. Listen, nothing happens without the power of a sovereign God in your life. And when something does happen, we know that all things work together together for what? Good. For good to them that love God and will call according to his purpose. And you may say, Pastor Mike, I don't know how this is working together for good. And guess what? I don't know myself either, but God knows and that's why he's so far beyond us and such greater, more greater than we could ever even fathom or comprehend. And that's where real faith comes in. So look at verse 3 now, right? In verse 3, and they commanded the people saying, now watch how this is worded. This is awesome how this is worded. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove, let's just, then ye shall remove your place, and say that out loud. Go after it. Go after it, man. That's what you do. You, you and I are supposed to be in pursuit of God. Now here's what happens in your life, right? God is going before you, but the problem is, is we don't follow after God. You see, the Ark of the Covenant to Israel, it was literally the presence and the power of God. And listen, they could have said, oh no, we're not walking out on that, across that river. No way. That river is deep. That river, those walls are going to clap down on us. This is how a lot of Christians are, right? Yep. And they just take a negative perspective, a negative point of view. Instead of saying, no, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to step out by faith and I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God's power. I'm going to trust God's person. And I'm going to trust God's presence that he's going to get me through this at this particular time, at this particular moment. And that's what Israel had to do. But notice this here again, right? When you, see the, the, uh, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests 
See that? No. The Levites bearing it. Now, remember, only the priest could touch the ark. You guys understand that, right? Yeah. Nobody else could touch that. If you touch the ark of the covenant, yeah. God would kill you. We've seen that with Uzziah when David was bringing the ark of the covenant back to Israel. It shook, and he put his hand out, and God killed him. He had no right to touch that. And you have to understand how this works in your life and my life. The first thing about becoming a Levitical priest, you had to be what? Born into it. You had to be born into the lineage of the priesthood. Well, guess what, folks? That's how you got saved, right? And the Bible says that he has made us what? Kings and priests. And the day you were saved, the day you were born again, God made you a priest. You know what that priest's responsibility was to do? His responsibility was to carry the power and the presence of Almighty God. And if you're here this morning and you're saved, you carry the power and the very presence of Almighty God. Amen. No weapon Amen. formed against you shall prosper, and God is going to lead and guide and protect you in everything you go through. And if God and if God allows tribulations and struggles and trials to come into your life, it's for His glory and it's for His purpose. Do you understand that? Amen. Guys, we have to understand that we are the priest, and we are bearing the very presence of God in our dispensation, in the time frame that we live in. And look at this. And here it goes, right? It goes, it goes the priest and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall uh, remove from your place. You got to get up and do something, folks. Amen. Listen, that was the main issue right here. God tells me, look at, look how it's worded. Remove, get up and do something. Right. Now here's the problem, right? What if Israel didn't do anything? What if they just kind of sat there and watched the potting of the Red Sea and they say, you know something, Joshua? This relate, this walk and following this ark of the covenant and following the presence of God and following the person of God, it's too much. You know something? I just want to stay on this side of Jordan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happens to a lot of Christians. They never cross over Jordan, right. and therefore, they never experience the power of the presence of God in their life. Now, let me explain this to you, right? I'm going to slow yep. down just a minute. One of the most sad things is, yep. is that you have people, even in churches like this, right. that have never, never experienced God's power. Mm. They've never experienced it. They've never experienced the anointing of the Holy Spirit overshadowing them. They've never seen God do something great. They've never experienced it personally. So then when other people talk about it, you look and you're like, man, what's all that about? And you don't even understand. Well, you have, in order for you to understand, right, the first thing you have to do is, what does it say in the context? Remove from your what? Place. You've got to get off your, well, and move and go. Right, man. That's what we have to do. And there are a lot of people that will never experience God's presence or God's power or God's person because they're not going after it. Right. You know, it's funny in, in the Psalms with David, David always talks about how he thirsts and he pants after God. If you read some of the, the Psalms, David says, my heart is fixed on you, O Lord. Right. David was a man that was in pursuit after God. Amen. That's why he's seen the power of God in his life. Why do you think he could overcome Goliath? Right. A young boy, 12, 13, 14 at the most, he kills a giant, a massive man, a massive monster. He goes out there when all of Israel was afraid, all of Israel was fearful, doubtful, confused. They didn't know what to do. And a young boy comes up and he defeats the enemy of Israel. Why could that be? How could that possibly be? Because he experienced the power and the presence of God when nobody else did. His older brothers didn't know what it was. Elihab had no understanding of the power and the presence of God. And those people were brought up with the things of God, but David was alone with God out there in the in the pastures with the sheep and just ministering to God, and God was ministering to him. Yeah. He experienced God's presence, so therefore he had great victory, and he seen God's power in his life. Mm -hmm. So what happens? You and I, we have to get up and what? Go, Go after, after it. You yeah. think it's going to be easy to be in pursuit of God? Yeah. Let me tell you something, right? It's going to take time. It's going to take dedication. You've got to go through discipleship one. You've got to go through discipleship two. Yeah. Some of you may need to go through it again and again yeah. In, yeah. in order for you to really process the information and understand it so you become in pursuit of God. You've got to spend time in the Word of God yeah. because that's where we come to know God is through the pages of scriptures. That's, <clears throat> that's where we come to an understanding of who He is. That's how we pursue God. Right. Yep. We have to move. We just can't sit around and, and click through the television and think we're in pursuit of God. You've got to pursue God just as Israel is. You've got to follow. You cannot take your eyes off him. What does Paul say? He says, I look forward to the presence of the mark of the, uh, the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Yep. He didn't take his eyes off of the mark. Now look at verse 4. Yet, ye, yet there shall be a space between you and about 2,000 cubits by measure. So they couldn't come too close to the ark, look at this, not near unto it. 
that ye may know the way by which ye must go. So they had to keep a vision. They couldn't get too close. They couldn't be too far. They had to have the right perspective. They had to have the right vision. Now watch this, right? In the latter part of that verse, for ye have not passed this way henceforth. Now, this is Joshua speaking to him. God is conveying this all through Joshua. He says, you guys haven't gone this way before. But guess who has? God. God. Mm -hmm. Aren't you glad that you serve a God that has, all, that has this whole world already mapped out? Amen. You know, sometimes we look around and we're going, oh, no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know what you're going to do? Just chill yep. and watch the power of God and keep your eyes on what he's doing. You've got nothing to be afraid of. You've got nothing to complain about. You've got nothing to worry about. God has already gone before us. The power and the presence of God has already stepped out into, into the future. So many times we think that God has lost control. You think God has lost control? I mean, we look at the things that politically and we go, God's losing control. No, no, no. God's right in control. Amen. He's in control of those nuts. Yep. I mean, think about it. God called Nebuchadnezzar my what? So he said, that's my servant. Amen. That's my servant. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't understand how these things work. And Biden is nothing more than a servant. Amen. <laughs> See, sometimes we, we, don't, we don't get these things, guys. Yep. You've got to understand, God, the Ark of the Covenant is going before Israel. That is the power and the presence of Almighty God. Israel had nothing to be afraid of. They had nothing to be worried about. Man, they had the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He just destroyed Egypt. The, the Red Sea just split. And now they finally come to the new brink of the Jordan River. And God says, this is what's going to happen. So guess what? They believed. And remember what happened to the first generation? What happened to all those people? They all fell. They all died. They all died. Every one of them died except for Joshua and Caleb. Let me tell you something. You know why they died? They didn't get to, uh, Moses died too because he disobeyed God. But here's what happens, right? When you disobey God and you don't trust God, you never, you never see the promised land. That's right. Yep. The yep. saddest thing is that most Christians will never experience that. It's so sad. It's sad. It's really sad. They've never really seen like the power of God. They've never seen God grab hold of somebody and change their life. They've never experienced the pages of scriptures jumping out at them. They've never really seen God reveal something to them. They've never really experienced God's presence in their life where they just fall on the ground and they're just weeping and weeping with tears of joy and adoration before God because they've experienced this person. They've experienced his presence. And what do they do? They fall on the face of their, they fall on their face and they're just joyfully worshiping God. A lot of Christians will never experience that. They just come to church and everything's cool, blah, 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 and we go up because we're not really in pursuit of God. Right. If you, listen, if they didn't go after the ark, they would have never experienced anything. Remember, once they got over the Jordan River, it, it opened up a whole new series of battles for them. Yeah. But they had to have the ark of the covenant with them in order for them to overcome those battles. We have to have the presence of God in our life. Yeah. Look at verse 5. Watch this, right? And Joshua said unto the people, look at this, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders, wonders among you. He tells them, sanctify yourself. Now that word means to what? Separated. It means to be separated. It means to be set apart. Now you have to understand this. As a child of God, your life is not your own. Does everyone understand that? Amen. No. You, you, seriously? Amen. Your life is not your own. Your time is not your time. Your money is not your money. Your life is not your life. And I know a lot of people say, Pastor Mike, I can do whatever I want. Yeah, you can. And you can make a mess of things. And God will give you, God will let you go on his, on his uh, not his perfect will, but he'll let you go on his other will. And he'll let you make a mess of everything in your life. You see how that works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guys, you can do whatever you want. You think your life is your own, but I'll tell you right now, you're going to stand before a holy and a righteous God someday, and he's going to judge you for everything you spoke. The Bible says that you're going to be judged by every word that has proceeded out of your mouth. Not only that, but he's going to judge you for your actions. He's going to judge you for what you did for him or what you didn't do for him. The Bible says it's appointed on a man once to die, and after this, the what? The judgment. You think your life is your own? You say, I don't even believe that book. Well, the Bible says every knee shall what? Bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, Lord to the glory of God. You don't believe it? I'll tell you, when you stand before a holy and a righteous God, you're going to believe. Right. It'll be too late then. You'll hear, depart from me, you work of iniquity into everlasting flames. Let's see what happens here now. Look at verse 6. 
when you as a child of God, you're supposed to be sanctified. Does everyone get that? Amen. Mm -hmm. yep. You're supposed to say, okay, God, I'm, I belong to God. My time, my money, my energy, my efforts, my thoughts, everything I have belongs to God. Right. My family. Mm -hmm. And until you come to that point, yep. you're never going to experience God either. Right. Yep. You, you got to listen. The priest in the Old Testament, the Levitical priest, all the people, God would say, sanctify yourself. That means to take yourself and set yourself apart. You know what it means to become a Christian? It means that God, I've accepted you as my personal Lord and Savior, and I am sanctifying myself. I belong to you, Jesus. Amen. Yep. Amen. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the what? Lord. Lord. Lord shall be saved. And I know a lot of this nonsense is just, you know, Oh, just, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let me tell you something. You're confessing him as Lord, and you ought to be sanctified and set apart yes. right. for the master's use. Yep. For the master's use. Mm -hmm. Now watch what happens here, right? And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, mm -hmm. Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the ark of the covenant, and look at this, and went before the people. Once again, Joshua said, you go before the people. Why? It's because the power of God had to open up the Red Sea. I mean, the Jordan River. The power of God had to do its work. And what we have to understand, God has already gone before us. We've got nothing to worry about. Whatever happens in this world, God is allowing it to happen. But God has already gone before us. Now, if you keep going on, let's, let's just, we're going to drop all the way down to verse 11. Actually, let's do this. Let's read some of these because there's so many applications here. And the Lord said unto Joshua, verse 7, the Lord said unto Joshua this day, I will magnify thee in the sight of all Israel. Now remember, Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. And so what did God do to Jesus Christ? He magnified him. Yep. You remember when Jesus Christ came to the river and he got baptized? You guys remember the story, right? Yes. He got baptized. What river was it? Jordan. 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 Now he got baptized. Now watch what happens. It says that heaven opened up yep. and God spake and it says the dove sent it down. And God says, this is my what? Beloved, Beloved son. son. You know what God did at that point he magnified Jesus Christ yep. and Jesus Christ was magnified he's saying now you're going into your ministry now you're doing what I called you to do Joshua literally means Jesus yeah. in the sight of all the people that look at this uh, that that they may know that as I was with Moses so shall I be with thee Moses is another type of Christ as well all right now look at this and uh, and now shall and now shall command the priest that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the, of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still. Now notice this, right? That takes faith, right? Yep. I mean, guys, the Jordan River is big, and it's muddy, and it's deep, and, it's, and there's all kinds of stuff in there. And they had to just walk in and just stand still. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God has called you to just be still and know what? He's God. That he's God. Yep. You know, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. Some of us are so busy. You know, whether it's scrolling or looking at the television or just consumed with our jobs and our career. And we get so consumed yeah. and we're not just being still and watching the power and the presence and the person of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. God wants to reveal things to you. God wants to show you his majesty. God wants to show you his beauty. God wants you and I to experience him. That's the greatest thing you can experience. Yeah. And you know what the funny thing is? We're always too busy trying to experience other things. Right. We want this. We want this. Give me this. I need another car. I need this. I need this. And we want more, more, more. And the only thing that is ever going to satisfy you and fill your soul is what? Jesus. 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 Yeah. His person, his power, and his presence. Yeah. Right. That's the only thing. Trust me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nothing else. No. You can keep looking. You can keep running. Yeah. You can keep spending. You can keep traveling. And it's all going to come empty every single time. So it tells him, stand still. Look at verse 9. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, come hither, okay? And hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, come on. God wants you to hear these things. And Joshua said, hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you. Listen, this is what it's all about. You know what God wants to do? Yeah. Just let human beings know that he's real. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's it. Now I know what stupid people say. Well, why doesn't he do this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because an evil and adulterous generation, what? Seeks, a sign. Seeks after a sign. Yep. And no sign shall be given. Right. Listen, guys, if you need a sign, you know what you do? You go, you go down to the beach, right? And you watch that sun set. Yep. There's a picture of the death of Jesus Amen. Christ. And you, if you could stay up, you watch that sun rise. Yep. And there's a picture of his resurrection. Yep. You want a sign? Your very existence is a sign. That's right, man. You sitting here, breathing, thinking, yep. batting your eyes. 
That Amen. is a sign from Almighty God. Amen. Amen. People are crazy. God, I need a sign. <laughs> well, no sign shall be given to them, but what? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be what? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There's your sign. Amen. You want a sign? You've got an old King James Bible that literally expounds on Israel's history and human's history. There's your sign. Amen. And then you know what other sign he's giving you, which is kind of strange? And you don't even, you just kind of ignore it? It's your conscience. It's your conscience. God's giving you creation. He's giving you a conscience. And what do we do? We ignore our conscience. We just ignore it. Like it doesn't even, like it doesn't even exist. Your conscience tells you about, that there's a God. You know what's funny? You get these young kids, you know. The younger they are, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, they're easy to tell about Christ. Then they get older, they begin, they get brainwashed. The young ones, man, that's why Jesus says, you got to come to me like a little child, right? Yeah. The older you get, the more this world corrupts and perverts your mind. You and I are not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be what? Transformed, Transformed by the what? Renewing, Renewing of your mind. This world system, the education system, the religious system, the political system, hey, and all the philosophical systems that are out there, it's going to pollute your mind the older you get. That's why it's hard for older people to get saved and come to an understanding of who Christ is. Yeah, right. If you're here and you're not saved this morning and you've never experienced God, I, I, my heart goes out to you because, man, especially what's going on in this world right now. Those of you who have, those of you who have children, you know when you got to get them? you got to get them when they're young. Yeah. Or this world's going to get them and the devil's going to get them. This world the, between the television, the media, the TikTok, the Nick Knock, the Hip Hop, whatever it is, it's going to get them. Yep. It's going to get them. Yep. Unless mom and dad get them. Because mom and dad have experienced the presence and the power of God. Amen. Look at verse 11. Oh, look at verse, we got to cover verse 10. This is awesome, right? And Joshua said, hereby you shall know that the living God is among you. You guys don't like that, right? Yep. He's like, listen, guys, I'm going to show you something, and this is going to confirm that God is amongst you. Now, let me ask you a question as a child of God. Do you got something in your life, personally in your life, that confirms that God is amongst you? Amen. Have you ever really experienced the power of God? Has, have you ever fallen on your knees and wept? Because God has revealed something to you and showed something to you, and you've experienced his presence in such a way that you couldn't even get off the ground. Yeah. You're literally prostrate before a holy and a righteous God, and you've seen yourself for what you really are, and you've seen him for who he really is. Mm -hmm. Have you ever really experienced that? I wish to God you would. Look at this, so in verse 10, right? This is awesome. And Joshua said, hereby... Ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that, th that he will, uh, without fail, drive out. Now watch this. He's going to drive out all the ites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the, uh, the, the Hittites, and the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and the Gasherites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Now notice this, right? Joshua is telling them, this is what's going to happen. God is going to take all of your obstacles. God is going to take all of your enemies. God is going to take all the things that go before you. Once we get through this river, God is going to go before you, and he's going to lead you into victory after victory after victory. Sometimes we forget that as a child of God, and we're walking around as though we're defeated. Guys, you are a child of the sovereign living God. Listen, Christ dwells in you, the hope of glory. You are never defeated. So many times, Christian, well, this happened in my life. This happened in my life. Let me tell you something. Joshua went through all types of battles and obstacles and trials. But listen, they were victorious. Doesn't the Bible say that we are more than what? Conquerors through him that loved us? Doesn't the Bible say I can do all things through Christ who what? Strengthens me. Some of us are walking around as though we've already been beat up and defeated. Guys. Listen, there's a series of battles. You may have fallen down, but you get back up for the next round. You may have gone through some discouragements and some hurts and some pain, but you know what you do? Yep. You get back up because you know you're on the winning side. Amen. Amen. Yep. You know that God's going to get you through whatever he's going to get you through. Yep. Look at verse 11, right? Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord 
Watch this. Uh, the Lord of, look at this. All the earth passed over before you in Jordan. I love that, the way that is phrased. Yep. Look at it again, guys, if you missed it. Behold, the ark, the presence and the power of God of the covenant of the Lord. The covenant is a bond and it's a relationship of the Lord of the earth. Uh, look at of all the earth. You see that? Yep. God is telling his people that those demonic other gods, the gods of the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, and all those other gods, he's saying, listen, you have the one and the true God. Yep. Here we are. We, look at a, we live in a world where there's all types of different beliefs and different religious philosophies and different things that people see. There is one God, and it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I know that's not politically correct, but it's biblically correct. The Bible says that I am the Lord your God, and there is what? None else besides me. There are no other gods. Nope. God gives them confirmation that he's the Lord of all the earth. And he's passing over before you in Jordan. You know, when you think about God being God over all the earth, man, you imagine that? It means that he's controlling everything. Yeah. He's controlling the weather. He's controlling the tides, the currents. Yeah. He's controlling the storms. He's controlling everything. We look at these other Gentile nations all around us. God is sovereign over them as well. Now look at verse 12, right? Now therefore take you 12, uh, take you 12 men out of the tribes of Israel, every uh, out of every man a tribe. In verse 13, and it shall come to pass, as soon as your soul of the feet of the priest that bear the ark of the Lord, now watch this, the Lord of here it is, of all the earth, once again, shall rest where? In the waters. Do you guys see what's happening here? God controls the, the weather. He controls the water. I mean, you guys know the story. Jesus Christ, he tells the disciples to go into the boat. They get into the boat. And then what does Jesus do? He comes later on, and the boat is in the middle of a storm. And Jesus Christ says, be still. God controls everything. I love that story because Jesus Christ set them up so he could build them up. Jesus Christ told them to get in the, he told them, guys, get in the boat. Go over to the other side. I'll meet you later. He comes walking on the water. They're like, oh no, what is this? And then he just calms the storm. God's the one who told him to get in the water. God's the one who put him in a position of danger, hurt. Why did he do that? So he could reveal his glory to them. Right. Sometimes God will put you in predicaments that aren't comfortable, that you don't even like. But God says, you just do what you're supposed to do, and I'm going to reveal my presence and my power and my person in your life. <laughs> now watch this, right? The latter part of verse 13, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down uh, from above, and they shall, look at this, they shall stand up in heap. Now that is an absolute miracle. It's a miracle. God was revealing to the nation of Israel his power. Now, if you know the story, the other nations were hearing these stories and possibly, I even believe, seeing these stories, seeing some of these events from afar. They, they were overwhelmed because now they know that there's one true God. It always bothers me because people will say to me, Pastor Mike, what about these different parts of the world? What about these different nations in these different countries that never heard of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, if you follow Jewish history, right, yep. the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was always exposed to these Gentile nations. Do you guys know that, right? I mean, God exposed them. Think about it. What did God do with Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, Nebuchadnezzar looked in there when he seen three Hebrew boys that were cast into the fire. He looked in there. He goes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He says, I see another one in there, and he looks like who? So, the so, son of God. Yep. Not like these corrupt Bibles say, and the sons of the gods. <laughs> And then even later on, Nebuchadnezzar, that guy gets saved. Right. Yep. He was God's servant. Yeah. Don't we serve an awesome God? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We serve an awesome, awesome God. Yep. Oh, man. I wish some of you would get to know this stuff, man. Look at this. The Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon and can you imagine that? Can you imagine that miracle? Just seeing that power of God do great things? Now look at, look, let's see what happens here. Look at verse 14, right? And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan and the priest bearing the ark, of, uh, the ark of the covenant before the people, and they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the ark 
were dipped in the brim of the water. Look at this. For the Jordan overflowed all of its banks uh, all, all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city of, of Adam uh, that, that is beside Zetern, and that these that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, filled and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. So now they come through and they have to face their first battle. Man, guys, your journey with God is a series of battles. Mm -hmm. It's a series. The Bible says we don't wrestle against what? Flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. The weapons of our warfare are not what? Mm -hmm. Carnal. Yep. Your whole life as a child of God is battle after battle. You've got three enemies, three opposing enemies, the flesh, the devil, and the world, and we're going to have battle after battle after battle. My Bible says, but be of good cheer. Jesus Christ has what? Overcome, Overcome the world, world, right? Look at verse 17, right? Uh, the priest that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground. You see that? They stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan, and all, all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people, look at this, were passed clean over. Now, let's look at chapter 4, okay? Let's look at chapter 4, and let's see what happens here. And um, I just want to kind of point out one thing, and then we'll cover the rest of chapter 4 next week. But let's look at verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean, in other words, they got away scot-free, they were clean, they didn't get muddy, they didn't get dirty, you know, God cleared that path for them. That's what he does for us. Now look at this, passed over Jordan, that the, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you, watch this, 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe a man. Okay, so there's 12 tribes, they had to take one man out of each tribe. Now, verse 3, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood, twelve stones, and ye shall carry, carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. So they had to go and get these twelve stones, twelve, one from each tribe, had to get the stones. Now, watch this. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in, uh, into the midst of Jordan, and take ye every man uh, of, of you a stone upon his shoulder. So they, weren't, they were big stones. They had to carry them on their shoulder, according unto the number of the tribe of the children of Israel. Now, this is awesome. Look at verse 6 and 7, right? That this may be a what? Sign. A sign among you. All right? That when your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, what mean ye be these stones? What, what are these stones here for? Now look at verse 7. Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant and of the Lord. When ye pass over Jordan, the waters of the, of the Jordan were cut off, and those stones shall be for a what? Memorial. memorial. They're a memorial unto the children of Israel. Now my question is to you, do you have a memorial in your life? A time, a date, something that's tangible that you can look back and say, I experienced God in my life. And I'm not asking you, well, I, I mean, I took the Eucharist, no. I'm talking when it was just you and God. I'm not even talking in church. I'm talking at home, at work, when it's just you and God, and you've got a time and an experience that you look back to, right, still to this day, as a memorial. When you think about a memorial in the Bible, it's, it's a monument, something that was established to put there for what? Remembrance. Remembrance. Yeah. We see these people who were trying to destroy the memorials and the monuments in the United States. What were they trying to do? They were trying to destroy American history. Right culture of this God-given country. Mm. But do you have something in your life, a memorial, that you can just receive, that you know God did something astronomical and super powerful in your life? Have you ever experienced God? And I know a lot of Christians, they've come to church, 
And I don't even know if they're saved. I hope to God they are. But they don't have a memorial that they can look back and go, that was God. I'm going to give Bo's memorial really quick. He was over there jobbering up on the Dunkin' Donuts, right, Bo? And you know, and, and Fast Eddie went over there. You know Fast Eddie. Yeah. But Fast Eddie's like, yeah, church is right there. And Bo came in, and we just seen the Spirit of God just move. He's got a time and a day. He's got a memorial where he can go back and say, God did something in my life. Amen. Where's your time? Where's your memorial? That you can go back and say, man, I experienced God's presence. I experienced his power. I experienced his person. I experienced who God is. And my soul is thrilled. And my life is never the same because of it. I don't see things the same way. I don't act the same way. I can't even think the same way. Even if I try to think the same way, I can't. Right, yep. Amen. right guys? Right. Yep. Amen. Have you truly ever experienced his presence, his power, and his person? Let's bow his word for it. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We just thank you for the word of God. We, we thank you for its anointing this morning. And, um, God, just, you are so great. Yes. You are so great and so powerful, Lord. And sometimes we lose sight of that. Help us to realize you go before us and you, and you even travel behind us. You watch the front and you watch the back. Yes. Lord, help us to realize that we have your power and your presence in our life. Lord, help us to realize that you're the God of all the earth. Lord, just give us that faith and that trust in you, Lord. And Lord, I'm sure there are people in here that have no idea with what I'm talking about. They have never fallen on their face and experienced your presence or your power in their life. Lord, I, I pray, God, that, that their hearts will be tender enough and open enough so they can experience you. As the Bible says, harden not your hearts as they did in the provocation. And Lord, it was the first generation that hardened their hearts and never really experienced the very presence of Almighty God. And Lord, I pray for everyone here yes. that your grace will be upon them. I pray for the families, the children, everything, God. We ask you these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.